Turn your copy of the Word of God to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading at verse 12 here in just a few minutes. We are finishing this series of messages that I've been calling Reach. We've talked about reaching up in our relationship to God, reaching in with my relationship to the church and taking my part there, reaching out and engaging the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ and making disciples. And today I want to encourage you to reach forward based on the words of the Apostle Paul here in Philippians chapter 3 that I'm going to read to you in just a moment. You know, there are many things in life that we can change, lots of things we can change. If we don't like our hair, for instance, we can go to the barber shop, we can go to the style shop, we can get a, a new style, or if we don't like the color of it, we can change the color, something that is easy to change. We know also that we can change our jobs. If we're in a job perhaps that we don't like or we don't like our employer or we're having difficulties or challenges, we can put in a notice, we can put out resumes, and we can begin the process of changing our jobs. I mean, if you go home today and you look at your flower bed and you don't like the way the flower beds look, you can get in there and you can pull some weeds and you can put some new flowers in and you can begin to change the look of the entire thing. Many, many things in our life. We can change. We know some things are beyond our control, but lots of things within our realm of influence have the ability to be changed. But we do know, of course, that there's one thing that cannot change in our lives, and that is the past. We have no way of being able to change the past. We know that movies have been produced. We know that books have been written where people have imagined the ability to create a time machine. You've seen this before, right? Where you could go back in time... And perhaps you could change some decisions that you've made in your past. Unfortunately, not one second of the past can be changed. Not one second of the past can be changed. Now, for just about all of us, we know that the past holds some wonderful memories... I'll just use myself personally. You know, I, I was blessed to grow up in a wonderful family. I have many great memories of times that we spent together and places that we went, things that we did that will always be precious to me. I remember as a kid, maybe getting about $5 a quarter put in my pocket and going to the arcade, spending about, about an hour playing my favorite games. Because then the cost of quarter back then, man, $5 take you a long time to spend through all that. I can remember, I can honestly remember, when the University of Tennessee used to have a good football team. It's amazing. That's the truth. I was a senior. I graduated in 1998. That was the year they won the national championship. Man, that was amazing. I can remember all of that. And so I wouldn't want to change all that. Those are good memories and those are good times. But I bet that as all of us begin to look back in our past, we can look back there on painful things things that we wish we could change. Abuse and neglect, those are painful memories. The mistakes of our past and the consequences that perhaps in some cases they have created, we know that those are painful memories. You know, don't you wish that our brains were designed like computers? And if there was something back there on the hard drive you didn't want anymore, you can just hit the delete button and let it be wiped out. And that's no longer a part of your memory. But unfortunately, our minds do not operate that way. I'd say that probably explains why many people in our country are on medication, are suffering with depression and anxiety, battling with things from their past, Many people diagnosed with mental illness. And many of those things, I think, can be traced back for a lot of people to things that happened, traumatic, terrible, horrible things that they regret or things that happened to them in their past. Things we wish we could go back and change. Today, it's not my goal, nor could it, would it even be possible for me to help you delete all the painful, shameful experiences of your past. That's not my goal. My goal today, though, is to help you begin to get victory over all of the things in your past as you understand truly that through faith in Jesus, you are a child of God and you're empowered by the Holy Spirit and you are everything that God says that you are. That's my goal today. Let me read the Word of God for us in Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. If you're there and you're happy to be here, say amen. amen. 
Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Several important things I want to bring to your attention today as it pertains to us having victory over the things in our past. Number one, I would encourage you today to understand your present condition. Understand your present condition. What did the Apostle Paul say in verses 12 and 13? He said, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. And he says in verse 13, I do not count myself to have apprehended. He's talking about perfection. So what we're saying then is there's not a single one of us that is perfect. The Apostle Paul said, I'm not perfect and none of us in the modern age are perfect. No matter how good we think we are, every single one of us has work to do as it pertains to loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourself. Every single one of us has work to do. Now, when we look back and we think about our accomplishments, you know, the devil, he loves to deal in pride. He loves to make us prideful people. And perhaps sometimes we can look back over the course of our life and see that we have accomplished some wonderful things. I'm going to use the example of the Apostle Paul several times in this passage because not only is he the guy who's writing the words that we're reading today, he had a powerful testimony himself. And he says at the beginning of this chapter, let me give you the context. He says, look, our victory comes through faith in Christ. He essentially says at the beginning of the chapter, there was a time in my life when I thought my victory, my value, came through everything I did, every legalistic tradition that I thought, every rule I thought I had to keep, I thought that's where my salvation was. I thought that's where my righteousness was. And in fact, he gives us a list of those things, beginning back there in verse 5. He says, if anyone thinks that they may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so, because he says, I was circumcised the eighth day as every fine Jewish boy was, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. You don't climb much higher than that. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, killing Christians, murdering them, taking them captive. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Man, if you were looking for somebody who could keep all the precepts of the law as they were explained by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, I kept all the traditions. I did everything that they told me to do. But the Apostle Paul goes on to say, look there in verse 7, he says, What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. You ever wondered if your relationship to Christ will cost you something? It cost the Apostle Paul everything. Everything that he had gained, everything he had worked for in his life, everything that everybody else said he ought to be, it cost him everything. He says, I have suffered the loss of all things, but I now count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith. In Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. He says, look, I was willing to lose everything in order that I might gain Christ. Are you so willing, sir or ma'am, would you lose everything in your life in order to gain the Lord Jesus? Paul suffered the loss of all things so that he might gain Christ. Have you ever thought about what Paul was doing in his life up until this point or what he had done prior to this point? He says it there in his testimony. He says, I was persecuting the church. I was killing Christians. I was doing everything that they taught me that I was supposed to be doing. But none of that was pleasing to my Savior, Jesus. And so what happened to Paul? Back in those days, he was called Saul. He was traveling on the road to Damascus where he was going to murder more Christians, by the way. And the scripture says that Jesus showed up, convicted him of his sins, struck him blind, and by the power of God, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. He was a brand new man when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. All of that to say, 
where he had previously been a wicked, vile sinner operating against the church of the Lord, he had found Jesus Christ and he had been miraculously born again on the road to Damascus. But here's what he wants us to know about that. Even though I've been saved, even though I've received the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus, I still have not arrived yet. I still got work to do. I'm not perfect. In fact, the same guy who's writing these words that I'm preaching to you today wrote autobiographically in Romans chapter 7. This gives us a lot of comfort as followers of Christ to know that even great men and women of God struggle with sin like we do. You know what Paul said in Romans 7? I'm going to paraphrase. He says, the things that I want to do, the things that I need to do, for the glory of God, those are the things that oftentimes I find myself neglecting and not doing. And the things that I don't want to do, the things that I know are detrimental to myself and to the cause of Christ, those are the very things sometimes that I find myself doing. He evaluates his life. He takes a spiritual inventory and he says at the end of Romans chapter 7, O wretched man I am, who is going to deliver me from this body of sin? If he ended on that note, that'd be pretty depressing, wouldn't it? The very next words though are Romans chapter 8. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Today, if you placed your faith in Jesus, every sin that you have ever committed has been placed under the blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad? Every single one has been forgiven. You no longer have to fear condemnation in hell at the end of time. No, what you're actually awaiting and looking forward to is your eternal reward in heaven. That's what we look forward to as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, I believe though in Romans chapter 7, just wanted us to know, I'm not perfect. I fall short every day. You know, here's the problem that we have as Christ followers. The devil loves to get us into the business of comparison. But you know what kind of comparison the devil likes us to draw out from our lives? The devil loves for us to make what I call horizontal comparisons. Comparing myself to other human beings. You know, if we're not careful, we allow a little self-righteousness to well up inside of us because we look at the condition of the world, we look at the condition of our culture, we see people, we pass them by every day, we see people caught in all manner of iniquity and lifestyles and various things. And if we're not careful, we look at other people, we make a comparison to ourselves, and then what do we judge? We say, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. Look at me. I'm doing pretty good. I've got my spouse, I've got my children, I've got my school, I've got my work, I've got my job, I've got my church. Look at what I'm doing. I mean, compared to everybody else, I'm doing pretty good. You know why the devil loves for us to compare ourselves to other people? Because he wants us to set the bar really low. Let me ask you something. If you were going to go high jump, would you want to go high jump something two feet or something seven feet? Olympics is coming up this year. Man, I watch those guys and I'm just amazed when I see that they high jump over this thing that's like six foot off the ground. It's crazy. If we were setting the bar for ourselves... We'd be inclined to set it really low, right? And so what we do is we look around us and it makes us feel good about ourselves to see people that are caught up in lifestyles and various things that we think are an abomination to God. And then we say about that, well, I'm doing a whole lot better than they are. The devil wants us comparing ourselves to one another. What the devil does not want you doing is comparing yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's called a vertical comparison. And by the way, that's the only comparison that really matters. It's not so much how I stack up against everybody else. It's how I stack up against my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the way, was perfect. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, he was at all points tempted. In every way a man could be tempted, he was. And yet he was without sin. So if I want to compare myself to anybody... Let it be my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I compare myself to Christ, you know what I see? I've got lots 
and lots and lots of work to do. And let's be honest about it. We know that on this earth we'll never be perfect like Christ was perfect. I understand that. God understands that. But that should be our goal. That should be our aspiration. What did Peter say in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16? Be ye holy even as your Father in heaven is holy. That's our aspiration. As you do an inventory of your life, sir or ma'am, where do you see that you're falling short right now? In your love for God, in your pursuit of Him, in your relationship with Him. Where do you see your relationship now with other people? Are you loving them? Are you serving them? Are you seeking to make disciples and reach others for Christ? If the answer to some of those questions is, man, I'm coming up way short in some areas, then we're just like the Apostle Paul. We've not apprehended it. We've not yet attained our reward, but we are on the way. And Paul tells us how we need to continue on the way after we understand our present condition. He says to us, number two, forget your past mistakes. Forget your past mistakes. What does he say there in verse 13? He says, forgetting those things which are behind. Now, the way in which our English, we try to use the word forget is probably not beneficial to this conversation today because when we think about forgetting something, we even put those words together a lot, do we not? Forgive and forget. Well, I can just forget all those things from my past. No, you can't just forget all the things in your past. Things that I've been forgiven for still I can remember from my past. But here's the key. Knowing my past, I can choose to leave it in the past. Are you with me? Think about the example of the Apostle Paul. Clearly, I just read to you from Philippians chapter 3, the early part of the chapter. He could not forget the man that he was in his former life. I read to you as John was baptized up here this morning, and John's a wonderful example of that. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have been made new. So when I place my faith in Jesus, it's really like I'm beginning a new life. I'm regenerated. I've been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a remarkable thing. So I'm beginning a new life, but that doesn't mean that I forget the sins and the failures of my former life, the Apostle Paul certainly didn't forget about his because he just listed them earlier there in the chapter. But rather than forgetting his past, he chose to allow God to use his past as a means to bless the church. How does the story of the Apostle Paul impact you and me still here today? Well, it tells me this. If God could take a murderer and a heathen like the Apostle Paul and save him and put his feet on a path of repentance and use him for the glory of God, if God could do that to Paul, he can do that for me. And he can do that for you. I say to you today, sir or ma'am, doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter where you've been, if you'll reach out and place your faith in Jesus Christ today, he will adopt you into his family and he'll utterly transform your life. You'll be born again today through faith in Jesus. Nobody is too foul that they cannot be used by God. Have you ever thought about the fact that perhaps the reason maybe God does not permit us to forget our previous life and our previous way of doing things when we place our faith in Jesus? Maybe the reason God does not permit you to forget your past, problems, failures, sins, shortcomings, bad decisions, is because God wants to take those bad decisions, those bad choices, those bad things from your past and weave them into your life and make them now part of your testimony. You know what a testimony is? We get a very simple outline for a testimony from this same guy, the Apostle Paul. He's been apprehended for preaching Jesus. He's been arrested. He's about to make his appeal to Caesar on his way to making his appeal to Caesar about his faith in Christ. He makes one stop before a man named King Agrippa. We read about it in Acts chapter 26. And Paul, guess what Paul does when he stands in trial before King Agrippa? He starts sharing his testimony. And there's three elements of any Christian's testimony. Get this. 
There's the person that you were before Christ found you and saved you. Then there's what happened when Jesus Christ convicted, convicted you of your sins and became the Lord of your life. And then number three. There is what has been happening in my life ever since Jesus took control what God has been doing in me and what God has been doing through me for his glory. Those are the three elements of any Christian testimony. <clears throat> Can you imagine how much weaker the testimony of the Apostle Paul may have been if God did not permit him to leave those details of his past in his testimony? I want to ask you today, have you been addicted before? You ever had a bout with prostitution? You ever had bouts with pornography? You ever made shameful decisions that you are not proud of? Do you know the reason that God maybe wants to leave that as part of your testimony? is because there's still people out there that are battling addiction. And there's still people out there that are struggling with pornography. And there's still people that are using drugs and using prostitution to get their drugs. And perhaps the reason that God has left this as part of your testimony in your life is so that you can be used for the glory of God to reach people with the gospel of Christ. You know, I'm a pastor, and I was blessed with a wonderful upbringing in a great Christian home. Now, I've done all manner of sin in my life as you have too. But there's some paths of sin that I haven't walked down. Perhaps I've walked down others that you haven't walked down. You know, sometimes I get to minister to somebody. I get to share the gospel with somebody. And they're struggling with a stronghold in their life that I've never struggled with before. You know what's really powerful for me? When I can call one of you my brothers and my sisters in Christ who have struggled with that stronghold before call you and say, will you come with me and let's go share the gospel with this person? Because this person that we're going to go share the gospel with is struggling with the same stronghold that Jesus gave you victory over years ago. And now perhaps through you, the Lord can show this person how she or he can have victory in their life. It's just amazing how the Lord begins to do great things when we share our testimony and use it for His glory. Now I want to say this and I want to move to the next point. We should never allow the devil to make our past Lord over us. If you are born again, you have got one Lord in your life and your Lord is not your past. Your Lord is is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't hear anything else I say today, listen to this, please. If you're a born-again follower of Christ, you are not defined by your past. You are defined by the Lord Jesus Christ. You are who He says you are. And you can do what he says you can do. The devil might come to you and bring up all these things from your past. And sometimes I've said to the devil, you know what, devil? You're exactly right. I'm everything that you say I am. I am the vile sinner that you say I am. But here's what I also am, devil. You left this part out. I'm forgiven. I'm saved. My name has been recorded in the Lamb's book of life. My sins are under the blood of Jesus. See, you left that part out. That's what the devil does. The devil wants to remind you of when you were in bondage. He doesn't want to remind you of when you found freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say to you today, you are not bound to your past. You are bound to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is your identity. This is going to help somebody today because somebody's sitting out there thinking, well, if the pastor really knew what I had done before, he wouldn't feel that way. And I'm saying to you, sir or ma'am, it does not matter what you have done. If the Lord could take a murderer like Paul and use him to become the greatest missionary the world has ever seen, he can cleanse you of your sins as well and let you be born again by the power of God. All you must do today 
is through faith. Believe that the blood of Jesus is enough. And ask the Lord Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. And if you'll do that, He will. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've done. He'll save you. Number three, and finally, we've got to put the past in the past, Paul says. But then number three, pursue your future prize. Pursue it. Verses 12 through 14, the Apostle Paul says these beautiful words. He says, I press on. And then he says in verse 14, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize. Here in this passage, Paul, I believe, is using the analogy of a runner or of a race. Or we might even say of a derby. Wasn't there some sort of derby yesterday? Bunch of horses out there running. Those horses, to watch them run, I know people gamble and do all sorts of foolish things around that activity, but it doesn't negate the fact that those animals are beautiful and they're powerful. And it's amazing to watch them run. And when they run, they are looking ahead. Their gaze is on the goal. They are pressing forward. And they are fixed on the goal. They're running as hard as they possibly can. Or, you know, we've got the Olympics coming up this year. You know, these athletes, they compete in all manner of races, sprints, these various competitions they have, some in the 100 meter, 200, 400, 800, 1600, all sorts of athletes out there racing against one another. These athletes, they're going to come together this year. They're going to compete at the Olympics. And here's the truth of the matter. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I could name a single one of their names. I don't know. Now, I'll probably get to know them as the summer begins to unfold. And we're introduced to these amazing Olympic athletes. But at this point, I don't know a single one of their names. But I do know this, I guarantee you. About everybody in the Olympics this year competing in a race, whether it's the 200, the 400, the 800, whatever it might be, I will guarantee you right now, guarantee you, none of them are going to run backwards. (laughs) This is world-changing information right here, isn't it? I guarantee you they're competing for the gold, the silver, the bronze. I will guarantee you right now, none of them are going to run backwards. But you know that's how some of us are trying to live our life right now. We're trying to run this race called life and we're looking backwards. God says, what you looking backwards for? I've got so much more out there in front of you. What is the goal? What is the prize for a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? The prize is where one of these days I take my last breath on this earth and then I enter enter into paradise with my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I get to bow down and worship at the feet of my Savior Jesus. That is the prize. When one of these days we're going to leave all of this sin behind, we're going to leave all this nonsense behind, we're going to leave all this injustice behind, and we are going to enter into the presence of Jesus where we will never hurt or struggle with sin ever again. That is the prize that we are pressing toward as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's what is in front of me, why am I looking at the mess behind me? What I've got in front of me is so much better, so much greater. You say, well, pastor, it's too late for me. To use that analogy of the race, I've stumbled out of the block. I've fallen down in the race time and time and time again. And there's already so many others that are well ahead of me. Well, in case you didn't know, the Christian life, beloved, is not about how you start. The Christian life is about how you finish. And when you take your last breath one of these days, my prayer for you is that you've got your head held high and you've got your chest put forward and you are running into the wind of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You may have messed up over and over and over again in your life, but when the Lord Jesus calls us home, let us be pressing forward for the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, knowing that everything in our past is under the blood of God. 
of Jesus. We have got to press on. Let's quit worrying so much about all the silly things we have done in the past and all the terrible things that have happened to us in the past. And yes, I know real trauma comes from that. I know real pain and torment comes from that. But no matter how badly you were treated in the past, no matter what manner of terrible things happened to you in the past, I promise you this, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ is much greater than the trauma of your past. So put your eyes on Jesus and press forward for the glory of God because until the Lord Jesus Christ calls you home, he has got work for me and you to do down here in this world. And I cannot walk into what God has for my future if I'm still looking back on my past. I've got to fix my eyes on Jesus. And I've got to run with perseverance the race that has been set before me. We've got to consider where we are presently. We've got to put the past in the past. And then we've got to press forward into our future for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I used the analogy just a minute ago of the Olympics, and I do love to watch them. You know, they only come on once every four years, and now it's been five years because of the pandemic last year. So I do enjoy watching the competition. I remember this happening live when it happened. Barcelona Olympics, 1992. There's a British sprinter named Derek Redman. You can go back and watch the YouTube of this. I encourage you to do it this afternoon, but you have a Kleenex available to you when you do it. Here's what happened. He got in the starting block. They're running the 400. He comes out fast, sharp, focused, out of the starting block. He gets about 100 meters in. He's doing well. He gets about 150 in. He's still pressing forward. He gets to about the halfway point. You ever seen a runner where it looked like they blew a tire before? He blew out his hamstring. And for a man who's run... Mile after mile after mile, race after race, they know immediately what has happened to them. He knew immediately what had happened. And he begins to cry profusely on the track because I'm sure he knows, I've been waiting for years for this moment to come. And now my moment's been taken away because I've blown my hamstring. And so he begins to cry and weep. But then something inside of him happens. I remember watching this just as a kid. He began to try and hop down the track. He had no chance of winning. There would have been no shame in him stopping the race because he's already blown his hamstring. But something inside of the man says, you can't stop now. And so he starts hopping down the track. This would never be permitted to happen today in a post-9-11 world. But the man's father is sitting up in the stands and he sees his son suffering on the track. And the father leaves the stands, comes down to the track, puts his arm around his son and says, come on, son. We're going to finish the race. And for about 200 meters, the father brought his son around the track. And the father with his son finished the race together. How do you feel like you're doing in the race right now? You feel like you're tripped up? You feel like you're falling down. You feel like you've blown a hamstring. I say to you today, look up under the heavens. Call upon your heavenly father. 
When your time comes and you reach the end, you might stumble across. But if you've got your faith in Jesus, the Heavenly Father will make that crossing with you. You keep hopping along and pressing forward in your relationship with Christ. Would you bow down?